So the, for the official bio, Samim Frechter lives in Brooklyn. She loves saturated color and believes in queer possibility. She holds an MFA in fiction from the University of Maryland and is the recipient of fellowships from the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities and Vermont Studio Center. She is a 2020 Jane Hoffman resident at Paragraph Workspace for Writers and a recipient of a 2020 Rana Jaffe Foundation Writers Award. Um, and a special shout out to Rana Jaffe Foundation. Um, we partner with them to support women writers through fellowships and grant assistance. And in the past, the foundation has also funded visiting um, writers, uh, visiting women writers. So um, they're an amazing foundation and we're so happy that you're here with us team and that you received such great recognition for your work. So oh, sweet. I I feel like I'm imagining that I'm at the Vermont Studio Center like library house and we're all sitting around a little fire novel, which is very much in progress, but um, I'm going to read to you a little bit from it. Um, and I guess um, what you need to know about the portion of this novel that I'm going to read, it's from, um, I'm reading from Toward the Beginning. Um, and this is a novel that came largely to life, at least in its current incarnation at Vermont Studio Center. So um, this is doubly lovely. Um, okay, so Shiva, it has been dumped recently, about three months ago by her first real girlfriend, Danny. Um, and she's also just started a graduate program in Jewish folklore studies and is like very much struggling with imposter syndrome. Um, and just on the edge of meeting with her graduate advisor for the first time, gets a text from Danny who has dumped her saying that they need to talk. Um, so that's the situation. Um, other people who will be mentioned is Hannah, who is Shiva's mother, and Mira, who is Shiva's great grandmother, who's kind of a mysterious figure who comes from a place called Rupschitz in Poland, which is close to Warsaw. Um, and Rupschitz, where my great grandmother is from, is known for this very famous Jewish wedding jester. Um, which is a thing. There are like Jewish wedding gestures, and he was a historic one. I think that is all you need to know. Sorry. Shiva's also just been notified that she has funding to go to Warsaw for research, so she's about to buy the ticket for that trip. It should be ceremonial, thought Shiva, so she went to pour a drink for the occasion. She looked at her counter, low on bitters and no other cocktail accoutrement, just the dregs of a bottle of bourbon. She used to have vermouth on hand for when she had Danny over, along with Danny's two favorite simple syrups, fancy ass sugar water, she called them, saffron and cardamom respectively, but Shiva had torn through them after the breakup. She put an ice cube in a small makeshift tumbler, formerly a caper jar, and poured the bottle's remaining thimble of makers over it. Lacking any sort of worthy accompanying snack, she ate the five remaining cashews in a plastic bag sitting next to the depleted whiskey bottle. Then she sat on the couch, opened her laptop, and started Googling Warsaw ticket prices. Warsaw. She knew the ghetto, of course. The uprising, of course. But now? She imagined squat, square buildings and Holocaust tour groups, gray weather and faces saturated with despair, pierogi, maybe, stone memorials, monuments, stern sky. What else did they eat in Poland? Who lived there now? She was woefully undereducated about her ancestral homeland. She didn't know yet that, perhaps surprisingly, one of the most popular and well-made foods in contemporary Warsaw is actually ice cream. She didn't know yet what still burned there, what still blew there on the wind. She sipped, looked at her phone, and wished she hadn't texted Danny back so quickly that afternoon. The last text she'd sent Danny, a weak and punctuationless OK, throbbed on the glowing screen. How was any of this fair? To dump someone and then reappear right after they've made one of the biggest moves of their professional and creative life, vaguely announcing that a conversation needs to happen and giving zero further details? She Google image searched Warsaw. The images were Disney colorful, turrets and cobblestone and unnaturally bright skies. This surprised Shiva. Warsaw had always sounded so grayscale. She tried to imagine her great-grandmother Mira against one of these saturated landscapes. 
Her only point of visual reference was the grainy photo that hung in her mother's hallway, Mira and her husband Isaac in front of the Isaac store they'd just opened in Trenton, New Jersey in 1927. Mira, stocky and determined, broad nose, thick eyebrows, dark gleamy eyes, and wavy hair she kept short and pinned close to her face. We don't talk about Mira's old life, Hannah would say, anytime Shiva asked a question about her great-grandmother. What do they want? What do they want? What do they want? I'll say that. Mira was very private mm. and didn't like to talk about her past when she was alive, so we need to respect that in her death, too. As a teenager, Shiva found this baffling, now mostly just infuriating. There had to be a statute of limitations on protecting a dead ancestor's privacy, right? Sometimes Hannah deflected by talking, of all things, about Mira's cookies. I wish I had more to tell you, she'd say. Remember her cookies, though? Those walnut cookies she used to bake, the fat ones, the ones that weren't overly sweet? Ma, Shiva would say, I was three. I don't remember cookies. She Google image searched ruptures, image after image of Naftali Tzvi Horowitz, the laughing rabbi. He's why you laugh so loud, Hannah would tell Shiva whenever she burst out with her signature cackle in public. You're descended from a village known for its sacred wedding gestures. City of laughter. She image searched Rupschitz, the Polish spelling, and there, more hypercolor images of an Eastern Europe she'd never seen, nothing like the warmth of the folktales she knew or the rounded, moonlit villagescapes she'd always imagined. She sipped her whiskey, watery from the ice in her apartment's quick heat. She went to kayak.com and entered the dates she hoped to travel. It was soon, a little over three months. She winced at the prices. She should buy a ticket now if she didn't want them to go up even more. Funding would help. She was starting to feel wiggly from the whiskey. It was late and she hadn't even begun to think about dinner. Her phone dinged. Danny, Friday afternoon still work for you? Want to do Friday at four? You pick the place. The still felt annoyingly familiar. Danny had long surrendered the right to remember or reference anything about her schedule. She took another drink and made herself wait five minutes before texting back. Yes, meet you at the Muffin Connection. The Muffin Connection was a place that had no business being open in Brooklyn. Puffy blue couches, fluorescent lighting, and a mural of several cartoonish dancing coffee beans exchanging pleasantries like, it's bean lovely, and take a break from the grind. It reminded Shiva of some place the friends on Friends would have hung out back when everyday muffins were still novel, everyone ecstatic that they could get away with basically eating cake for breakfast. It was the perfect place to reserve for terrible or terrifying conversations, a place she wouldn't mind ruining forever. She and Danny had shit-talked the muffin connection often enough that there was no way Danny wouldn't take the suggestion as a burn. Good, thought Shiva. She was drunker than she should be on a Wednesday, mouse hovering dangerously over purchase ticket. Did Danny even miss her? What could she possibly need to talk to her about in person? Their third date had been a breakfast date. Very little talking at all, just the sweet, languid weather and the propulsive rhythm generated by one set of adrenalines meeting another. Iced coffees and mimosas and generous stacks of pancakes at a little brunch place with a small patio. Blackberries and maple syrup and nervous laughter under viney twists and late morning sun. Afterward, they'd walk to Greenwood Cemetery, one of Shiva's favorite places in Brooklyn to walk. I never would have thought to take a date to a cemetery, said Danny. Verdict, Shiva asked. Her eyes were shining so hard she could feel the shine from the inside. The verdict is very promising, said Danny. They walked behind a mausoleum and Danny stood on her toes, tried to peek inside. Shiva came up behind her. Danny turned abruptly, pulled Shiva close, their bodies sealed against the cool stone. Foreheads pressed hard together inside the stillness. Occasionally a reverent breeze and under the slight swish of the crown of branches above the graveyard, they didn't kiss, but something else, something galloping drum furious in the tight space between their chests, Shiva bright and aloft, her vision woozy and the sun champagne fuzz. Danny's skin a new texture, warm, smell of cedar. Shiva's face ached now, all the back and forth choreography of crying and trying not to cry. What if Danny said she was sorry that she'd messed up? that she wanted to get back together. Shiva turned to her glass, but it was empty. She shook her head. She was lonely, alone, sorry for herself. In her old place, she could have been distracted by the din of roommates cooking, gossiping around the clink of wine glasses. She may even have confided in one on a night like tonight. But here in her big old one bedroom, no one else to participate in the pitying but her. Outside, full on dark. Maybe she'd order Chinese food. She needed a distraction. 
She picked up her phone. She wished she were the kind of person who could delete Danny's texts, but she still had every single one from that first, howdy, this really your number, to the one just now. She opened Instagram, started to type in Danny's name, and then heard her best friend Levi's voice saying, unfollow her. She couldn't, not quite, but in homage to her best friend's wisdom, she closed Instagram and in its absence, let her drunken thumb scroll over to the dating app she'd revenge downloaded the last time she was drunk. No, she thought. Why, she thought. She swiped left a dozen times out of habit, rejecting the same Brooklyn profiles she'd seen before, all of whom were not Danny. Then, realizing she could, she updated her settings to within 25 miles of Warsaw, Poland. Romance in Eastern Europe. That sounded like the right kind of distraction. Did it? Not even a plane ticket yet, and already trying to scheme intrigue in the place her ancestors walked, where her people's collective trauma still hung in the air? What would Mira say, she wondered. She giggled alone in her apartment because she was drunk and because who knows what Mira would say. Not Hannah, that's for sure. She put on a Tegan and Sarah playlist to make the sad feel more like a sad gay party. Internet cruising in Poland felt wrong, so there was already kind of a thrill to it. She swiped left and left again. Magda with the rainbow scarf. Sophia, whose face was partially obstructed by a tree. Anna, who looked bored and had a dog. Christine on a Fulbright from Cleveland, touristy photo and overeager grin. PhD student, barista, music teacher, veterinarian's assistant. Left, left, left. Shiva picked up her empty glass, willing someone to top her off, but she knew she'd killed the makers and that she should be responsible and have dinner instead. Left, left, left. The universe telling her that her fantasy had been tasteless and off base. Her thumb kept swiping, as though she could swipe Danny out of her phone and her consciousness by way of swiping her way through all of Poland. Just 10 more, she thought, just until 8.05, no, 8.07. Left, left, left. And wait, this one. Shiva's thumb stopped. No full name, just the initial G, a face made of severe angles and a swatch of black lash. Shiva tightened at the throat. G, what did it stand for? Or was G her actual name? She scrolled down to the profile part. There wasn't much. Self-summary, quiet and tall, books, fishing, old films, motorcycle mechanic. What I'm looking for, the river and someone to show it to. Next to I value, just a little rainbow flag icon, a moon, and an animal emoji that was too small for Shiva to see. There was only one other photo, and in it, G next to a motorcycle, helmet under her right arm. I'll never find someone with Danny's kind of swagger, she'd told Levi, crying one whiskey night. This, though, was someone else's kind of swagger. And she could feel her temples hotter, her tired thumbprint beating as she swiped right. She felt like she should hear a sound or be congratulated on some abstract mission accomplished, or at least that someone should bring her another drink, but it was pretty anticlimactic. Swipe right and wait. So she waited. She switched back to the travel tab she still had open, the round trip ticket still staring back at her from the screen. Checked her bank accounts, checking, savings. The department money wouldn't come through for another couple of weeks, Rosen had told her, but technically she had enough in her savings account to buy the ticket. Don't overthink it, she thought, overthinking it. It's so easy. One simple click and suddenly I'm a person who's going to Poland. She felt momentarily existential, re-forgot and re-remembered dinner, realized she had to get off the couch before she disappeared into a lightweight whiskey-fueled vortex and clicked purchase. She texted Levi, holy shit, I bought a ticket. I'm really doing it. I'm going to Warsaw. Then, giddy and flimsy-headed, she walked to the kitchen to scrounge up something tipsy and random for dinner. It was very late in Brooklyn, and Shiva was already fast asleep when her phone dinged to announce that she had a match somewhere across the ocean and a message that simply said hello. Hey, would everyone like to unmute for a second and give Tamim a round of applause? That was so good. Yay. Yay. Good job. <laughs> that was really good. Um, all right. If you um, re-mute, I'm just going to ask Tamim a few questions and then open it up to you all. Um, feel free to keep your video on if you'd like. Um, Tamim, thanks so much for reading that. Section. 
does that come towards the beginning of, of your novel? Is that the opening section or? It's not the opening section, but it's toward the beginning. Yeah. So we get the introduction to the character, um, one of the main characters, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's, tr- it's toward the beginning and I appreciate everyone listening to very, very new material. Thank you. Um, so I read that you're working on both a short story collection and the novel. And I was wondering if you could describe each different project. And I, I, from what I read, it sounds like they're kind of interconnected on some level, but I was wondering if you could describe both projects. Well, they're both very Jewish. Um, cause uh, I guess it's me. So that's what I do. Um, so the novel is, uh, I, I tend to call it a multi-generational speculative history of my family. It's not actually about my family, but I sort of took the places, the geographies on the timeline of my own family and pilfered them and sort of made up you know, what if there is this kind of queer energy or queer shape-shifting spirit that had touched each generation in this family? Um, not only queer in terms of desire, but it's just sort of queer in terms of possibility and, and echoes and refractions. And it was a really fun exercise. You know, I have a very forgetful family and also being a queer Jewish person, like so many other people, there are parts of our ancestral stories that are, you know, in various ways and to various degrees, like obstructed, not accessible. And so I think it was a powerful exercise for me to make some stuff up um, about the place my family was from, Um, using some information, but kind of patchworking the rest together. Um, The short story collection is, I just realized I was writing a lot of stories that featured Jewish holidays. And I grew up pretty religious. um, And I think it's, that's more, my religiousness is more interpretive at this point. But I felt like, you know, the Jewish, the Jewish year has a kind of shape to it. And um, so I'm just kind of following that shape. It's almost a spiral shape in my mind um, and writing stories that kind of touch like Jewish festivals in different ways and um, the kind of lore of Jewish festivals. So. Yeah, I read that um, it's structured around the, the, the calendar year for Jewish holidays. And I was wondering if if thinking about how form and structure can serve, I I mean, you know, I'm a poet, so I think about like form and structure, but also in fiction and prose, how form and structure can kind of provide the skeletons of of which to navigate a a narrative. And I'm wondering if if that's helping you link those stories. Um, Yeah, absolutely. And I'm also like, I just feel like I love having this conversation here because I feel like I want to hear what everyone here has to say about these things. But um, I, I actually took a, I, in my MFA, um, I have a dear friend who was also my teacher, Maud Casey, and I think she's been at Vermont Studio Center. Oh, you got to work with Maud. She's so amazing. Yeah, she's one of my favorite people. And she, um, she taught a class on, on form that was really about like, I had thought of form in this abstract way, I think, in fiction, and she taught us to kind of really look at, like, form and structure and, like, dissect how a story is, like, literally built like a structure. So for one of our assignments, she asked us to draw, to write a story in a shape, uh, to pick a structure and kind of imitate it. And so I tried to write a story in the shape of a spiral. And what that ended up being was kind of thinking about, like, the sort of Jewish high holidays where you kind of return and repent and return over and over to the same moment, but you're different each time you return. Um, And so each section is kind of titled September because it's always just kind of coming back to September. Um, And then it just, it was really fun. So it let me think about like, how could I do that? You know, Shavuot is the, this Jewish holiday my family celebrates where there's this lore that at midnight, the sky bursts open. And for like one split second, you have access to like whatever's beyond the sky. Um, And so I was like, what would a story look like that kind of cracked open in the middle, you know? Um, So I don't know where it will end up. It's still like very much in formation, but it's fun to like chase the exercise. Cool. Um, So I I pulled a quote from the Rana Jaffe Foundation website and you said that, I quote, I feel a kind of urgency, the most excited and hungry kind to finish this first book and launch it into the universe. 
My path has been nonlinear, and as such, I take the hard work and spiritual maintenance of building a writing life very seriously. Um, I loved that quote, and I also read that you began as a musician, and I was wondering how maybe mu music inter might intersect or influence your, your writing. Yeah, it's such a, it, it's something I think about a lot because my music career was almost a decade long and it was never my first love. It was kind of like a, I played the drums in a rock band and it was fun and it was a wild adventure, but I was never, it was not, we never quite fit me and the drums. And so um, it's almost like I take, I take something, I, you know, I take something of that almost misfit. I mean, it was a fit for a while, but the sort of fact that like, I, I came back to writing from trying this other thing. Um, it just, you know, I actually just, I'm about, I have a story that's about to come out. That's about a, like kind of a failed rock drummer. So I think I'm just po processing some of it in fiction, but um but yeah, I mean, I think I also come from a very musical family. The music of language really moves me. Um, I was trained as a poet and um, I, especially, you know, in this book, there's a character who starts to develop an obsession with Tears for Fears. Um, so definitely like a lot of music in my stuff. And I listen to the song Shout like 14 times, Jen knows this, <laughs> 14 <laughs> times on repeat, I listen to like, the song shout for research and you know it kind of is how I do research guys like it's, I don't do real research <laughs> um well yeah because you describe the novel as polyphonic but polyphonic it, and can you say something I don't I'm not familiar with that word can you say something more about that word sure so I think what I mean by it is that there are sections that are narrated by birds there's a section where park benches start to speak um, there are sections that aren't narrated by mirrors, but the mirrors kind of function as characters. Um, so I'm thinking of it as a world, I think for me, a lot of the polyphonicness of it is that like, I don't always see spirits or see the things that I know are here in this world, but we can't totally perceive, but I like to insist that they're there. I like to insist that these kind of magical things are like among us. And so I think to me, like making the park benches talk is a kind of like writing into that insistence of like, yes, of course the park benches are gonna start talking in this book. Um, so that's what I mean by polyphonic. It's like not just humans that are kind of telling the story and refracting this, the story of this family. Um. I think I would like to open it up to other people if anyone else has questions. Um, I think that this could be pretty informal. You could just raise your hand and or just unmute and raise your hand and then that you'd like to say hi to Tamim. Do you have any questions? I'd like to hear more about the seasonal stories and more about um, the structure, creating structure. Yeah, I, like, I, to be honest, I'm not sure yet. I feel like it's still shaping. I think I have, like, six of them, um, and right now the structure, so, um, for example, I just finished a story that is structured like the Passover Seder, um, and in that ritual there, are, I think it's, like, 14 different steps, so there are 14 sections, and um, I think right now it's really this conceit to kind of allow me to play with the themes of each holiday, with the kind of folklore of each holiday. Um, I'm not sure how much of it is going to, you know, if and when it becomes like a full manuscript, like I'm not totally sure like how it's going to function, but I think so often for me, structure is super, super helpful in like digging into the content and the, and the soul of like an idea. So I think right now that's, it's sort of guiding me. You know, I grew up around so much ritual. So I think it's almost this ritualistic way of writing into the holidays and, and we'll see where it goes. Kristen? Hi, thank you so much for putting this together and hi to me. Hi. 
Oh man, it's so great to hear your voice. Um, it's been like a treasure for, it's one of the treasures from Vermont Studio Center. And so to hear new material in your voice is really awesome. Um, I, I wanted to say how much I love your description of like the current experience using a phone, communicating and dating and dating ahead into a new location that's like sacred in your imagination. Like, oh, it's, it's incredible to have that thing be written, which is like obviously true, but never, I've never heard described before. Um, and I, I love the idea of the embodiment and the voice of like the inanimate objects having spirits. And I wondered if you could talk or just spend more time in that, like how you're thinking about it, what it feels like when you're writing from that perspective. Like, are you possessing the bench and speaking through it from its constraints or are you imagining the bench's point of view? Like, what is that like when you're writing it? So I, yeah, I mean, I, I grew up like a, around a lot of Jewish folklore and it's like, you know, a duck will just start talking or like a weird like tree becomes like Elijah the prophet, you know, I mean, and of course in my like kind of irreverent imagination, it's probably like not quite that weird, but it becomes weird. And so, um, I think that's a part of it. I think a part of it is just like, I, I want it, I let myself get kind of deeply weird with like, you know, I was in Warsaw a couple summers ago and I just, there were just a lot of park benches and I was like, okay, like my great grandmother was like near here. I've never been here, but these park benches have been here. Like, I mean, I could have thought like, oh, the trees have been here, but being like the suburban and city kid that I am, I was like, oh, the park benches have been here for a while. <laughs> Um, so there's that. And then, you know, I think like I had this, um, another exercise at my, at my MFA program actually, which is apparently very generative. Um, Gabrielle Lucille Fuentes, another great fiction writer who, um, taught me, had us cultivate obsessions with artists who were not writers. That was part of, and I like highly recommend the exercise. It was super generative to be told to kind of go deep with like a dancer or a photographer and just obsess. And so I obsessed over Claude Cahoon's work, um, who is like a queer, gender queer Nazi resistor, um, who was a photographer, and who apparently had this thing for this bird called the curlew, which is impossible to sex, according to research that I've done. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I just, I think I was trying to write about Claude and I couldn't quite get close enough. and. So somehow embodying the curlew and just speaking from the perspective of the curlew was like a way to get close. Like, I don't know Claude, but I know birds sort of, you know, I've seen birds, <laughs> I've encountered birds. So it's a way of getting at things, I guess. Yeah, name. Um. Hi. Uh, so Christy, you totally said and asked what I wanted to say and ask. Like it, it was uh, uh, really both mundane, like like not mundane, but um, uh, coherent, you know, con consistent with daily life to hear someone talk about uh, using the phone that way. But it was also really startling in a great way to hear it written. Um, so um, I, I also felt that way. Um, so great, great job to me. <laughs> um, and I uh, also just want to say hi, but um, tell me more about this uh, 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 jester, this wedding jester. Oh my gosh. So this is something I actually didn't really know about. I didn't know much about. So this, this village called Rupshitz, where my great grandmother was from, I just started hearing that this person called the laughing rabbi was from there. And I was like, who's the laughing rabbi? So apparently there was this kind of jester called a badchen, and I discuss this a lot in the book, um, who, it, and in still in ultra-Orthodox communities, they have badchens who go to weddings. And their job is to be, to tell jokes, but they're kind of very sacred, somber, intellectual jokes. It's not like, you know, a cut up on the stage. It's like, 
very weird Talmudic puns and like, yeah, I don't actually know. I've never seen one, but I've listened to a lot of podcasts and read a lot of accounts. And um, so, yeah, so, you know, I, I, for those of you who have ever shared space with me, you might have noticed that I have a very loud laugh. And I often think, is it because my great grandmother is from the city of laughter? Like literally from the city of wedding gestures that like, so, you know, I, I like to invent my own folklore. So I, I felt like I want to have this family where the women have laughed really loud. And like, you know, maybe the connection is tenuous, but um, there's laughter feels really important to my, to my family, to my kind of Judaism. And so I wanted to kind of pursue that idea that there's this wedding gesture and that's like the source of something important. That is so cool. Um, have you heard of the recent novel, uh, Teal, T-Y-L-L? No. Um, I think the author might be Polish, um, but it's about um, the jester, like he's a historical figure and a lot of it is mythical, but it's the jester that we get the image of a jester from. Um, and the New Yorker reviewed it recently and uh, my fiance uh, read it as part of her research and I read it and it's fantastic. Um, very different, it, you know, it's not, uh, not this type of gesture, which sounds amazing. But if you want to go deep on, on gesture history, it's a really fun read. It's really good. I love that. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. This is so cool. Thank you all for coming. What a delight. I had a more of a sort of, I guess, more of a procedural question, but I loved the quote that Sarah read about how um, you kind of come to your practice with a real commitment and seriousness. I think I really witnessed that um, in being in Vermont with you. And I just wanted to hear a little more about that. How do you approach your writing practice? Um, how do you structure your, your work? And do you work on things concurrently? And um, yeah, how do you sort of structure that, that part of your life? Yeah, I've had a, like a perennial problem with focus like my entire life. So it doesn't come naturally to me. And um, I think for many years I've tried, you know, tried different things. I'm going to write at this time or that time or this time. And um, it was just really only in the last five years that I've had a writing practice that has really stuck. So, you know, for me, it's like every morning I, I work a day job um, and I have some lovely coworkers on this actual call. Um, but I, um, I, work, I write from eight to nine in the mornings. It's not, that long and sometimes I'm late because I've overslept or I'm getting coffee but it's just like holding that hour where I just show up and touch the thing I'm working touch anything I'm working on um so that's really important um being in community with other writers is important so just talking about process like keeps mine alive accountability deadlines um uh, I'm in a lovely writing group um Jen is also in it um and I, just deadlines to kind of like turn in, you know, pages. It's so, it sounds crass, but it's really like, it's, it's what I need. And I think the other thing is just like ample space sometimes, like what Vermont Studio Center provided, and this is not an ad for Vermont Studio Center since most of you have actually been there, but like what it provided me was the necessary space to, as I conceive of it, it like literally blow open this kind of like fossilized manuscript that I had been like, oh, here are some ideas and there are some pages. And, um, but it took kind of having like real open space to kind of like put it up on the walls and blow it open and mess it up and put it back together to get anywhere. So that was a real lesson for me. Like, I think I periodically need that. Um, so it's a mix. I'm sure other writers on this call and other artists, like, I don't know why I keep calling it a call. It's because Zoom is weird. Um, at this reading, probably relate in some way that it's like a mix of a mix of approaches for me. Thanks so much, and thank you so much for sharing your new work. Oh my gosh! Thanks for listening. Hi, Tamim. Hi. Hi. Um, so I wanted to know what, like, so after you exploded the book in Vermont and then put it back together in a new way what like what's the shape journey or the what's happened to it since then however you want to answer that so I 
like, I don't know. It's like, I think for me, I'll have moments where I blow, I do blow it open and then I kind of drag my feet and I'm like, what do I do now? I did all this stuff. Um, and especially coming back from Vermont and it suddenly being a pandemic, I was like, okay, what do I do with this now? Um, I honestly, I'm not great at just, and I've, I've had conversations with people in this room about this, but I'm not great at like getting people from room to room in the story. I'm not great at the logistics of like, how did, what year is it? And what does the room look like? And so I think when I got back and realized like, okay, I have all these pieces of story, but the things that are missing are honestly like almost logistics. Like I need a scene where, you know, Shiva meets this person on nameless Tinder, you know, and like where she has an argument with her mother to, sh you know, because I'm, you know, I have this other scene where I'm like, oh, there's tension between them, but you know, I have to establish that tension. So I think it was almost like I had someone advise me to just kind of like sit down and read my book. I hadn't touched it since I got back from Vermont. She was like, curl up, put on a blanket, get a beverage, read your novel as though it's somebody else's and kind of be like, where are the holes? And that is what I did. And then I wrote kind of like badly into the holes. I was just like, and then she walked into the other room and then she went into the kitchen. And you know, what I've learned is like, you can make that saying more later. So <laughs> that's, that's, that's kind of it. Are there, are there, is it risky to not write those, to not include those scenes? Like how much can you push a novel to like trust the reader? Yeah. To like, or like, you know, like in the dream house, like the structure of that is like, is like super like all over, like there's like sections, like, and then the, it jumps around and moves around in time. Um, yeah. Like what, what risks um, are we willing to take with like taking out the scene, like, like making it too obvious um, is like something that just came to my mind. Totally. Um, yeah. And I think I'm, I think I, you know, I think I do the minimum. I think I, do, you know, I think I do some of that. I've trained myself to um, not be so precious about like, yeah, mundane stuff can also happen. You know, that's a part of a book. It doesn't have to be only nonlinear. Sometimes you need those connectors, but I'm totally, you know, this book does jump around in time a lot. And also um, the character Mira, who I referenced, um, the great grandmother, she shows up, um, she writes letters from the past. So we only see her in letters. Um, and there are other characters who are kind of largely off screen um, for, you know, dead and off screen, except in flashbacks. So I think it's a, it's a, like combination for me of trusting the reader and, and taking those risks. And honestly, like only a very few people have, <laughs> have read this, this book so far. Um, so kind of just listening to people who have read it to kind of hear where, where those fractures work and are interesting and where they sort of leave people just confused. And I think like as a fiction writer, who's always still learning, like, I think experimentation is really important to me, but also like making the writing accessible feels important too. I'm just wondering, are, are, do you feel like you're still kind of writing into those holes that you sort of blew wide open in Vermont? Or, okay, I didn't know if you were still expanding or if we're in like sort of filling in the holes mode. We're close, we're very close. That's we're so close, close-ish. <laughs> we're pretty close. <laughs> It, it sounds really challenging, like uh, what you describe. I mean, like, even though you're still in this sort of generative stage of writing a first draft, like you, the work that you're doing is like revision work. It sounds very difficult. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, again, if other writers relate to this, but I don't always relate to the idea of a first draft because there are parts of this book that have been revised <laughs> yeah. at, almost as I write, like countless times. Mm -hmm. And there are like parts of the section I just read that I edited like 10 minutes before I got on this. <laughs> before I joined this Zoom. So like, I think, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's, I think that's a struggle for me, honestly, but it's kind of a generative struggle to be in the space of both like really fine tuning revision, but also there are still places where like, I'm like not totally sure what happens. Mm -hmm. um, thankfully those are dwindling. That's
Um, I had one question about blowing it up, which I saw happen and also creates enormous feelings of anxiety <laughs> when you talk about that. Um, so I wondered if you made any kind of radical discoveries in that process or changes or what happened? Like, what were some of the results of that? Yeah, I just like, I just, you know, what I had when I came to Vermont Studio Center was basically my MFA thesis. It was like, you know, it was a series of kind of like chapters slash short stories that were like a little hybridy and kind of, um, but I wasn't totally sure how they went together. And I don't know how to ex explain it. I think everyone probably has their own like corporeal imagined relationship to their art process. But for me, it was this feeling of like, it's too small. Like I couldn't fit in. It was so like cemented. It was so done. You know, a, a committee had approved it. It was, you know, it was over. Um, which says something too about my relationship to revision. I think it's like, you know, it's hard for me to go back into something that feels so done. And so something about the, blo when I say blowing it open, I think literally just feeling like I had space. I had like eight hours a day for me because I wasn't one of those people who wrote <laughs> late into the night. Um, but you know, I had like eight hours a day to just kind of like be in this huge space and think and like put the pages on the walls. And I don't know, like characters literally started emerging, you know, um, the letters I was referencing, like those letters started writing themselves in Vermont. I was like, oh, Mira's writing me letters from Poland. That's cool, you know? And I don't think that would have happened. I don't think that was an idea I would have had that was cerebral. I think I really needed physical space and like actual time. And so I can't, for myself, I can't overstate the importance of that. And, you know, I try to find it now it kind of in the day to day, like I moved to a larger space. I have a dedicated writing space that really does help. So, but yeah, makes room. I don't have a question. I just wanted to say that I love knowing that those letters from Mira, because I've read the novel draft and it's just so amazing and wonderful. And um, I, I just love knowing that those, the letters that are from Mira happened while you were at Vermont Studio Center. That's really great. It's cool to know that they came because they feel so grounded and so organic to, and if you were far into the process or if you had a sense of the story so you know pretty well developed and those popped in later it's they just are so organic and natural and perfect so nice job <laughs> thank, you. thank you yeah i think what i had from what i had brought to the to the residency was like it was almost like artifacts i found in an attic even though i wrote them myself it was like okay here are the pieces there's some characters i haven't figured out how they relate to each other and i think the organicness is maybe just, I had this experience where I was like, oh, this is no longer cerebral. This kind of like sunk down lower into my body. And now it's like, okay, I can access like the ancestral vibes that I've been kind of searching for in, in this writing. So thanks. We have about 10 minutes left. And um, I promised to mean that we would have a short Q&A. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but, but um, it worked out just the way it was supposed to because you were all here with her and know, and I love hearing that when you were in residence together that you, that you had seen the project in different versions and um, that you could have an extended conversation from February, 2020 to, to now on Tamim's project. Uh, it feels really special. Um, are there, we have about 10 minutes. Are there any like, Anything else? Any other comments, questions? This is perhaps very silly, but I'm wondering like, what did you do when you found out you won the Rona Jaffe? Like, <laughs> like show us. <laughs> I don't know if I can show you. It was like uh, 10 a.m. during the workday and I got a call from Vermont and I ignored it because why would I pick that up? And then I got another call from Vermont and I was like, I guess I should pick this up. And then I was just on my bed silently screaming. Um, and my partner, like, my partner Aaron was like, I'll, like, we had some beer in the fridge. We didn't have champagne, <laughs> like, on hand. So they just poured 
beer into wine glasses and brought me one because I think they figured out what was happening. Um, it was very, it was very shocking and exciting. That's great. This is so, this is so nice. Can we just hang out like every Friday night? <laughs> yes. Can you read some more to us? <laughs> Maybe someone else will read next time. <laughs> hey, Tamin. Hi. Hey, buddy. Um, I wondered, for me, the things I've been like reading and watching during this, during the pandemic and uh, social unrest have been really special and dear to me. I think I'll remember them this specific way, uh, hopefully for the rest of my life. Like, what are you reading and taking in that you feel like will stay with you for a long time, hopefully, when we, the world is more normal? That's such a good question. I, um, I feel like everyone I know has had a really drastically different relationship to reading during this time. Some people are, like, reading so much. I have become a way slower reader during the pandemic, like way, way slower. So I'm currently reading um, Namwali Serpel's book, The Old Drift. Um, I'm finding it thick and wild and like it's multi-generational, um, mostly takes place in Zambia. It's mostly like matrilineal. It's very amazing. And it's a huge like canvas of a book. I'm taking forever reading, <laughs> like, I'm taking so long. Um, so I think like something that I'm doing is just, I think normally during the before times, I would get a lot of like, I don't know, people being like, oh, I read this cool like piece of flash fiction or I have this essay and it's kind of long and I just would save it for later. And I think I'm doing more now of like just reading people's work, both peers and friends and also strangers. Um, and I'm really enjoying that. Like, I feel like I'm like, you know, like today I read like several short stories that people I didn't know, you know, posted about having published on Twitter. And it was just, it's just a kind of like, for me, it's like a spontaneous, like, here's where I'm drawn in the moment kind of reading. Um, I'm excited to read. I don't know if anyone's read Raven Leilani's book, Luster, but that's like my ne next in my queue. So hopefully I'll finish this eventually. Um, how, so Luster is good. It's on my list. I haven't read it yet. Has anyone read it? Anyone else? I yeah. just started it, but I haven't finished. Okay. It's great. <laughs> Awesome. Um, thanks so much for being here. Thanks so much for supporting your fellow resident and for cheering Tamim on. And Tamim, thanks for reading. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you to Tamim. And I look forward to holding your book in my hands. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you, everyone, for being here. Congratulations. <laughs>